welcome to our weekly community call. Hopefully this one is going to be a little bit more interesting for you because rather than just me blabbing on with Jim, we got someone who's actually bloody good at his job. Well, I think I'm pretty good at my job, I guess, but very good at his job. And he's going to be talking about one of the subjects that you guys have a lot of questions about all the time. There's a lot of conflicting information about, and I think he's just going to bring a nice perspective that you may or may not have heard before. And I always enjoy my conversations with Daryl. So we've got Daryl from Coda Nutrition, formerly Shots, on the call today. Daryl, thanks for joining us, man. Yeah, thanks for having me, Ben. How you doing? I'm doing well, man. It's um, starting to get a bit cool down here now. So uh, got the jumper on today. Yeah, we were talking just before the we went live that you're now in Tassie. That's right, yeah, down in West Hobart. Um, a lot of uh, mountain bike trails, a lot of actually um, running is very big down here, trail running as well. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's certainly the place where a lot of mainlanders from Australia have been coming down and enjoying the, the trails. I bet they have. But winter's coming, it's going to start getting chilly, I bet. Yeah, which is actually not a bad thing um, because you just heat up so quickly in the in the bush here. So the cooler temperatures are actually nice. You can you go for a lot longer and not be as wasted at the end, which is nice. Yeah, no, I think we're all pretty envious of a cooler temperature. Yeah. We, we don't get that luxury up here, mate, you know? No, it's always hot and humid, isn't it? Always, always. Yeah. So I haven't seen you in a little while. When was the last time we saw each other in person? Probably 2019, Singapore Marathon, Singapore Marathon right? Yeah, it was. Yeah, so yeah. been a rough year? Yeah, yeah, it was um, particularly rough uh, I, actually, we were going on nicely. We thought that um, COVID would be a lot worse than we expected in regards to sales and that sort of thing. But um, we had a, an extra layer on top of COVID, the, the contract manufacturer that makes our electrolyte tablets burnt down. So yeah, that was um, very challenging and actually still, still a challenge. Um, we found a couple of new suppliers. So we're just working through... Um, the best supplier we want to work with because it's obviously going to be long term. Um, so it, it's a very complex process in that you need to you need to find a supplier that um, can provide the same type of product that you've already had in market for fourteen years, and different contract manufacturers have different suppliers. So ingredients um, taste profiles can change between each supplier. So trying to match the formulation has actually been quite difficult. So um, yeah, it's, uh, it's been very interesting. Yeah, running a business is never quite as smooth sailing as it appears from the outside, right? No, no, not at all. Uh, but, that, that, uh, we'll, that sounds tough. Yeah, we'll, we'll have, um, we should have some lemon flavored tablets by May. And then we'll have all three flavors, hopefully within the next few months. But COVID really smashed uh, production of pretty much everything, um, not just electrolyte tablets, but a lot of things. So um, I guess um, it, everyone sort of had that challenge of trying to keep up with uh, with production. And is that manufactured in Australia or where are you doing it? Yeah, in Sydney. Yeah. It was an interesting morning watching the news and seeing this factory go up in flames and realizing that's the place that makes your electrolyte tablets. So um, that was an interesting day, that one. It's interesting. I don't know yeah. if that's what I'd use, but yeah, I can imagine that wasn't a good day. No, no, not at all. But uh, just another layer on top of COVID. But it's all good. We'll get through it, and uh, we'll be stronger and better at the other on the other side. That's good to hear, man. So as you know, I've been involved with shots or carbo shots even. Yeah. Since the early days. So for everyone listening, I I was a teenager back in Auckland, and. Um, I managed to walk my way into a, a nice little sponsorship with Carbo Shots back in, I think it must have been like 96, 97. And they were the first ever um, company that ever had me on some sort of monetary bonus scheme. So if I got, you know, certain positions or if I got a certain amount of media, I actually got given a, a couple of hundred dollars or something, which for me as a teenager, it was just the coolest thing ever that I could make some money from um, doing the sport that I love so much. And since that time, I've pretty much been a Carbo Shots guy. There's a couple of exceptions for that. 
At one point, I was sponsored by Lepin, another Kiwi company, and another time by Balance. But outside of that, and even to today, I, I'm still using the, the shots or now Coda products because I, I particularly like your cola gel. That was my always my go-to gel. Yes. So I have a, a little bias towards you guys. Um, and I'm very grateful that you gave up your time to, to come and chat to us. But can you sort of, to kick things off, mate, can you just tell us a little bit about your background? Because it, it's quite interesting. And share how Coda came about. Yeah, sure. Um, it, it, it was the mid-90s and I had joined the fire brigade. And it was something that I'd wanted to do ever since I was a kid. Um, but so, not long after being in the job, I started to notice some interesting, thing, interesting things in that because I came from an athletic um, background with triathlon and uh, multi-sport racing and that sort of thing, I, I was always interested in performance and how the body um, performed, particularly in different temperatures and that sort of thing. And what I noticed with the firefighting was that you see things happen very quickly because the heats that you experience and the heavy clothing that you wear. And what I noticed was some firefighters handle the heat better than others. And it was quite interesting to me because um, what, I'd, what I'd had noticed was it didn't have anything to do with how fit you were because I, I knew how fit I was and I knew how fit the other firefighters were, but some of them were handling the heat much better than I was. And that was sort of concerning to me. Um, so after, it was probably a couple of years of, of um, recognizing this and finally come to a point where nothing really made sense. And I was actually contacting the Australian Institute of Sport to ask experts about what I was seeing and, and why I thought it had to be something more than how fit you were and all these other um, indicators that um, would, would think that you would handle the heat well. So. Um, I just then started doing my own applied research and testing the firefighters. And over a, a few years, what I recognized was the firefighters that handled the heat better had a lower sweat rate. So the volume of sweat that they lost was less. But interestingly, they had a much lower sodium concentration in their sweat. So with those two things combined, they were just able to handle the heat better, even though we're all drinking the same thing. And at that time, it was powdered Gatorade. So we're all drinking the exact same product, the same volumes, but because these firefighters weren't losing as much, they were able to tolerate the, the hotter conditions better. Um, and consequently, after sort of learning that and then testing the firefighters, me, one of them that handled, that didn't handle the heat as well, what was quite alarming was um, how much more sodium we were losing in our sweat. Um, and that was sort of the trigger and I thought, well, if this is how it works with firefighting and when the heat, there could be a crossover to, to sports and athletes. And that's when I started um, testing athletes and finding the same thing and finding that um, athletes that weren't doing well in the heat had a higher sweat rate and or a higher sodium concentration in their sweat. And then learning through um, actually very fortunate working with some of the best triathletes in the world, like um, Crowey, Craig Alexander, Caroline Stephan, Meredith Kessler, and learning that these athletes had lower sweat rates and lower sodium concentrations in their sweat. And it, it all sort of came together and um, that was sort of the beginning of it. And the connection with Carbo Shots in New Zealand, which you were sponsored by in the early days, um, my plan there was to become the Australian distributor, which we did. And that's when they were doing the gels. And in that time they were doing that liquid concentrate. Do you remember the liquid concentrate sports drink? Yep. Um, called Carbo Light. Yeah. So um, we became the Australian distributor and then we bought the business from Jared Hall, who would have been your sponsor at that time. And we brought all the manufacture to Australia. And uh, through all the stuff that I'd learned with the firefighters and then with athletes after that, I realized very quickly that the Carbolite or the drink solution, which was a, it was a calorie based electrolyte drink, um, what it didn't allow me was to increase the amount of sodium to address uh, sodium, uh, sorry, the, the extra losses that some athletes were losing, and particularly the firefighters as well. So 
that's where we introduce the electrolyte tablet, the effervescent tablet, um, where there's no sugar or no calories. Um, and that we could increase the, the sodium by adding more tablets to address the needs of, of different types of athletes and their unique physiological makeups. So that's when we dropped carbo, we became shot sports nutrition. And then a couple of years ago, um, a couple of mates came aboard and said, look, we want to go to, into America. Um, and I said, well, that's fine, but we can't get into America with shots because it's trademarked there. I said, you need to come up with a new name. And that's where they come up with CODA, which is the, it's a play on words. So CODA with a C, C-O-D-A is, it's like a crescendo, like the end of the piece of music, like the, the finish. And, uh, and obviously Kona, uh, K-O-N-A. So it's a combination of those two words um, and they come up with CODA. And um, yeah, we've been, I think we've been CODA for about 18 months now. Yeah. So, and how's the transition going? Has it been hard educating everyone? Not really. Um, the it, it was as long as the formulations don't change and you don't change any ingredients and it tastes as good as it normally does and does the job that it's supposed to. We don't really care what what it's called. So, um, no, the transition's actually been really good. And since you took over as shots too, like the polish that's gone into the product and the look of the all the packaging and everything is dramatically better. I remember back in the 90s, it was like a, a tube and it was all liquidy and trying to get it out of that thing without spilling it all over yourself. That was the yellow tube, wasn't it? Um, quite yeah. awful. So kudos on repackaging it and, and getting it in a much more functional um, package because it's, it's just so much easier to take now. Yeah, it, um, th that, that took a lot of uh, uh, different tries at getting it right. But uh, yeah, I think we're, uh, we're, we're onto it now. For sure. Now let, let's get into the questions. So we, we asked, we sent out a message to everyone, asked them if they had some questions and we've got a few back. There were some overlapping themes, so I'll kind of group some of them together. But I thought we'd get this one out of the way first because it just gives you an opportunity to set the tone and, and to explain your point of view and talk a little bit about the benefits of Coda as a brand and what you're trying to do. So Sean said, why is Coda different or better than other sports nutrition companies? And I know you've spoken a lot with me about not being a marketing company. Exactly. So I thought maybe you could start by explaining what a marketing company is and then go okay. into Sean's question where you sort of give the, the soft sell as to why you guys are better than the other companies out there. Yeah, well, that, that's, that's spot on. We're not a marketing company and that's, that's the, the main difference. Um, sadly, the industry is dominated by marketing companies who come up with some fantastic ideas and they sound great. Um, but their, their main ad objective is to get product out in the market, but as cheaply as possible. Um, so, and I'll use um, our gels as an example, because that's a, that's a very good uh, indicator of when you use, when you're purchasing gels, understanding that um, the main ingredient with some, and I'll, I'll use SIS in this example, um, the main ingredient in SIS is water. So people, and it's easy to take and it, it goes down fine and all that sort of thing. But the, the thing is you're paying the same amount for it, but you're consuming twice the volume for 30% less calories. So it would be like going to the petrol station, filling up your car, paying full price for a full tank, but you only get three quarters of a tank. So wonderfully well marketed, um, they reduced their production costs by probably half, but left their prices the same. So just understanding those sorts of things. And then also the maltodextrin component of, of all gels. Um, there's about 150 different grades of maltodextrin. So you start at the top where your quality um, ingredients where there's less, well, sorry, there's no refined sugars, there's no fillers, there's no um, impurities, like it's a very pure maltodextrin. And obviously it's expensive too. As you come down the scale, you have much cheaper ingredients, but you have a lot of um, added refined sugars, sucrose, fructose, which are naturally occurring, but from a manufacturer's perspective, they're very highly processed and refined. Um, so it's probably, I think the difference is the purity and the quality of the product. Um, we probably pay a lot more than 
um, others for our um, for our productions, but it's always been an understanding that right from the start, that the purer and better quality of the product, the less likely it's going to cause stomach issues, um, and that comes down to the preservatives that we've used because um, we have to use um, some preservatives, particularly for a product that has an expiry date for two years, and learning through that process of what's going to be less likely to cause any um, or, or compromise the stomach when um, when people or athletes are competing or training. So I think that's the main thing. It's that the quality and purity of the of the ingredients. And is there a way for consumers to, to know the difference or is it just it just says on the back of all gels multidextrin and it yeah. doesn't have a grade next to it. So there's no way to determine that. Yeah, you, you'll see um, like so, so fructose, as an example, um, there was a, a research that came out this, uh, it was um, Duke and Droop that did this research. And uh, it was right about the time that I'd recognized that not everyone, but some athletes had a real issue with fructose. And it was in its natural form, it's a, it's a sugar from fruit. It's a, it's a thing that we don't really have too much problem with. But in the crystalline form that manufacturers use, which is heavily processed, it can cause all types of issues with uh, with the stomach. So, and, and we'd recognize that because we'd have athletes come to us with stomach issues and um, using our gels, they weren't having the problem, but using other gels that had this fructose in, they were having the problem. So it, it, it took a while to work out, but it seemed to be the, the most common denominator. So um, any, any gel that has that fructose component in it, um, it's a much cheaper um, ingredient. Um, it it's nice and sweet and tastes great, but the amount of processes and refinements, I, I think for, for some athletes, their stomach just doesn't recognize it. And it can cause all sorts of issues from mild cramping through to, through to diarrhea, which is obviously things you want to avoid during uh, competition and, and training. Yeah, you don't want any of the explosive diarrhea while you're out on a marathon. Oh. No, you don't. <laughs> We've all seen those photos. Yeah, right. it's not. Let, let's talk a little bit about the separation of calories and hydration. So, Joy, well, firstly, you're the first person that introduced me to that concept. And as soon as you said it, it just makes perfect sense. Uh, I don't know why it wasn't thought of sooner. Um, but when I promoted this call amongst our members and I said, look, I'm speaking with you and you're the person that um, introduced me to the whole idea of splitting calories and hydration. Joy has asked, can you please tell us why it is important to split calories and hydration? Yeah, perfect. It's um, the, 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 the reason no one else has done it is because it's so difficult to market. It's not, you can't just put a one page ad in a magazine or there's, it needs to be explained um, because when you're up against Powerade and Gatorade and Tailwind and all these products that have this one size fits all um, program or, or strategy. The thing we need to understand is that every single athlete has a unique physiological makeup. So we can all go and do 10 laps of a 400 meter track in 25 degrees with an 80% humidity. And every single one of us will have a different sweat rate which means the volume of sweat that we lose will be different with all of us. Some will, some will lose 500 mils in that time and someone else might lose 1.8 liters in that time. So the first thing is with separating hydration and calories is you do not get locked into a set volume of fluid because that person with the um, low sweat rate simply doesn't need to drink as much as that other person with a high sweat rate. So that's why, firstly, we separate calories from hydration so you're not locked into a set volume of fluid. Um, the second part of that is sodium is the most important electrolyte that we lose in sweat. And the reason that it's most important is it's extracellular. And what that means is that it's mostly present in the bloodstream. And as we lose sweat, and that water that ends up in our skin, that comes from the water component of our blood. Our blood's about 80% um, water. 
So as we're losing that water, we're reducing blood volume. So that's why drinking during hot conditions is super important because we want to reduce, we want to make sure we minimize blood volume loss. And in that water is sodium, there's a little bit of potassium and there's a very, very small amount of magnesium, but mostly sodium. And the amount of sodium that we lose in sweat can range from as little as 300 milligrams for every liter of sweat we lose up to 3000 milligrams. So a massive disparity. So if you're using a powdered drink and you have a higher sodium concentration in your sweat, you're locked in to how much sodium is in that particular powder. And most are sort of around that 300 milligrams or so, which for most isn't anywhere near enough to replace the sodium that we lose in sweat. So by taking the calories out of the drink and putting it into a, an effervescent type tablet, what we can do now is, or what it's allowed us to do is for someone with a low sodium concentration in their sweat, they can just use one tablet. Um, with a moderate amount, they might put two tablets in a bottle. For someone with a higher sodium concentration, it could be two and a half or three tablets. So that way you can address your hydration needs and um, customize them to your own needs. And the thing is, if you're training and competing in Singapore where your hydration is gonna be super critical, um, but if you're the type of athlete who enjoys to travel and you know it's, a, it's something that, um, you know, part of your lifestyle that you want to experience races in other parts of the world. And you might come down to New Zealand or to Australia in the, in the cooler months, I mean, in Melbourne or even here in Tasmania or wherever that might be, the volume of fluid that you're going to drink is going to be a lot less than you would normally be drinking in competition in Singapore. So that way you can make those changes. But if you're relying on your calories in your drink, you're forced to drink a set volume of fluid and for a lot of athletes who have stomach issues in cool, colder conditions, it's exactly that reason in that they're drinking a volume of fluid way more than what they require at the time. And that's where they compromise their stomach. So I could go on to this for hours, but that's the main reason that we separate calories from hydration. So simply you can um, drink an amount that you require based on your sweat rate. You can add more sodium if you need to, if you have a higher sodium concentration in your sweat. And most importantly, not be locked into a set volume of fluid. You can drink the amount that you require based on the conditions that you're experiencing at the time. Sounds so simple when you express it in that way. But it's very hard to market that though. Like um, that's why once people understand that and they start to um, use that strategy in their in their training and racing, they notice straight away um, how well. Firstly, the, the most often the stomach issues go away. Um, the cramping issues that some people might experience goes away because they're addressing their needs better. And they're not relying on a one size fits all. It's like for those that um, who are runners or are triathletes, it's it'd be like walking into a running store and having one pair of shoes to choose from. And it might just be the perfect size for you, but that's the only size that you get. It might be too big. It might be too small. It might not suit your running style, but that's the only shoe that you can choose. So this is all these powdered sports drinks like Tailwind and Gatorade and Powered, all these things, that's the analogy. That's your one size fits all. So I think that's the best way to look at it. Yeah, great analogy. And I think for people who are interested to learn more, you've written a really good book called Sweat, Think and Go Faster that yeah. everyone should read. And I, by the way, I'll, I'll link that in the notes when I upload this because I think it's, it's definitely worth reading. You were kind enough to send me a copy years ago and it's significantly influenced my thoughts around the subject. So thanks for that, man. I've learned a lot more since writing that book too. It's been quite, quite interesting. Yeah. Awesome. So is there going to be a follow-up to it? Well, um, possibly, yeah. 
Yeah. Well, because I would have thought that's a very good way. For, I mean, that, that's your marketing right there, isn't it? Yeah, it is. But um, also, people don't want to read much anymore either. So, you know, everyone wants that 30 second bite. And that's why it's really easy to. And Tailwind is a perfect example. Their, their tagline is all you need all day, really. Now, it, it's there should be um, some governance on sports nutrition. You should not be allowed to say that because it, it's not all you need. It's not providing all that everyone needs. Um, you have to have a very, very unique physiological makeup to be able to rely on that product for an Ironman, for example, or, a, or an ultra uh, marathon or something like that. So that, that's where I get frustrated with these, these marketing companies that... Um, that don't really care too much about the athlete's performance. No, it's tough too, because when you're a small company going up against these bigger companies with huge budgets, it's a very hard way to compete. So yeah. I guess you just have to stand behind the quality of your products, write books, get on podcasts and, and just share your belief, right? Because I think once people try it, I mean, like me, they'll see pretty quickly that it's a good way to go. Yeah, definitely. I don't think it's a hard sell at all, actually. No, you just, you need things like this. That's, that's podcast work well. Cool. All right, mate. Let's talk a little bit about GI issues. Where was, you touched on it briefly, yeah. but Gonzalo had a bit of a two-part question where he says, why do some athletes suffer GI issues and what can you do about it? That's part one. Part two, and what gels or products do you recommend for people who regularly suffer from GI issues? Yeah, yeah, that's a great issue. Because, sorry, it's a great, um, great question because... It's, it's the thing that's going to slow us down. And it's what I've focused on um, with every product I've put together. It's about putting ingredients together that are less likely to compromise the stomach. Because once you compromise the stomach, um, you slow down um, to the point where sometimes you need to stop and you need to pull out of the event, which is demoralizing given the amount of time and effort that you've put into this event. Um, the, the thing is, the reason that you may not experience it in training sometimes is that um, it's hard to mimic race day. It's hard to mimic the nerves that you feel on race day. It's hard to mimic the intensity that you go at on, on race day as well. So um, it's always good to do some training sessions where, and I know it's hard to mimic, but try to mimic race day as close as possible and the intensity that you're going to run at and try these different types of products and see how it sits on your stomach. So I touched on the fructose thing. Um, the first thing we look at, if there's fructose in the ingredients, um, just be mindful that for some athletes, not all, and not everyone experiences stomach issues with the fructose, but the ones that do, um, once you've eliminated that from your products that you're consuming, there's a good, op good possibility you're gonna stop the, the stomach issues. Um, and once again, that's a refined crystalline form sugar. And it's not because you've got a sensitive stomach. It's more because you've got a heightened response to foods you shouldn't be consuming. And for a lot of athletes, they spend a good portion of their time um, eating well and trying to avoid these refined crystalline form sugars. Yet at elevated heart rate during activity, when their stomach's at, their mo at its most vulnerable, that's when they're consuming these particular ingredients without really knowing it. And that's why it's a lot of the, a lot of the time it's causing these stomach issues. So would it be important then to avoid fruit and other sources of fructose as part of a pre-race meal as well then? Well, the, the fructose in fruit is naturally occurring. So for a lot, they don't have any issues with taking fruit. Some do, but um, it's, it's the, and I, I normally have a sample of it because I can show it. It's just like, it's just like a crystalline form sugar. It's, it, it in no way resembles fructose in its natural form. So um, this is why I, I, I say to athletes, you don't have a sensitive stomach. You just have a heightened response to heavily refined processed ingredients, which is actually a good thing. But you, if once you're mindful of that and you start looking at the ingredients more closely, um, then understanding that um, it, it sort of helps with choosing uh, products to use, um, particularly for competition. 
Um, so the ingredients obviously play a big role then in whether or not you're likely to suffer from GI issues. I would imagine too then that the volume that you take or the frequency that you take them at also play a role. Spot on, yeah. So, um, and I can see that there's a there's a, um, a question later on about fuel for racing. So I'll just touch on the fact that um, the the volume is and the amount is is super important. Um, and the type of foods and the ingredients. Um, so you, you, you're right, there's, there's some athletes, and what we've worked out over the years, we, we've recognized that the stomach or the digestive system can tolerate about 350 calories an hour um, over an extended period of time. Um, there's one, there's a new company that's come on board called Morton, who say you can do 400 calories an hour. Um, I, I'm yet to see an athlete that can do 400 calories an hour over an extended period of time. It's, um, it's quite a large amount of calories for the stomach to tolerate at um, elevated heart rate, but not everyone can tolerate that 350 calories an hour. That's sort of an athlete. So if we're, if we're thinking of um, the sort of top 10 of an ultra marathon or sort of the top 10 or 20 guys in a, and girls in a um, triathlon, so of an Ironman distance um, where they're doing sort of between four and four and a half hours on the bike, which is we're using extraordinary amounts of um, energy. Um, they can tolerate about 350 calories an hour. Um, athletes that are not traveling as fast, um, try and aim for that 350, but most often it's just too much and it just compromises their stomach. Um, so the whole idea of that is understanding firstly that um, their calorie expenditure or, or units of energy that are expending is a certain amount and, and they adjust the amount of calories accordingly. And the thing is, you, know, you might burn between six and 800 calories an hour, but your stomach cannot replace all of that. You will always lose more calories or, or expend more energy than your stomach can replace. So in that case, you, you try to consume an amount that your stomach can comfortably tolerate. And if you're consuming too much, you're going to find that out pretty quick, quickly. And it's a good, it's a good lesson to learn in training um, that, you know what, my stomach can tolerate 230 calories an hour. That, and that's the best it can do. And that's my digestive system. And um, I need to deal with that. So... Um, you're spot on with the the amount can 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 cause that. Yeah, because um, I've seen a lot of times a lot of people think that it's like a one for one, right? Like that if you lose mm. six calories, you have to put back the same number of calories. But it, it's that never is going to work out well. It's bloody hard to do. No, no, you'll never ever replace the amount of calories. Um, and and a calorie is just a unit of energy. So um, everyone's got heart rate monitors now, and what you need to be looking at is, so if you want to run a half marathon or a marathon um, through, your, through your coaching program, the athlete's going to have an idea of what time they want to run. So from that, they'll have an idea of what pace they need to run to, to, to maintain that pace to run that time that they want to. So in training, they'll run that pace for an hour. They'll get an understanding of what their calorie expenditure is. And it might be you know, 400 calories or 500 calories an hour or 600 calories an hour, it depends on how fast you're running. It could even be seven to 800 calories if, you, if you're real quick. Um, so from that, um, you get an understanding of how many calories you need to consume. Um, if you find that you're getting to the 14 or 15 or 16 kilometer mark of the half marathon, you start to slow down, which most often is a, a fueling issue or you get to the, between the 28 and 32 kilometer mark of a marathon, which is, which is a, a wall for a lot of people. Um, so you recognize that, you know, I need some fuel earlier to get me through that last 10 Ks. So it's understanding firstly, your energy expenditure, and then how many calories your stomach can comfortably tolerate at that intensity. Definitely. So I assume too then, if you're a big person, you're naturally going to use more calories than a smaller person as well, right? Even if you're going slower. 
So does that have an effect or it doesn't really have an effect? It's more the intensity that plays a major role. Yeah, it, well, so with your heart rate monitors, it's just an algorithm. So it's really, it's, it's working off your height, your weight, and your max heart rate. So you can have two athletes exactly the same um, height, the same weight, running at the same intensity, but one of them, for whatever reason, their physiological makeup, whether they've got a greater storage capacity for glycogen in the, glycogen in the muscle, or whether their femur is two inches longer, or just these, all these different physiological changes that they might show that they're using the same amount of calories, but one is able to tolerate that um, energy loss better than another. So it really, it's just giving you a number. Um, it's sort of like a fuel gauge. It's telling you, this is how much fuel you're using each hour. And um, depending on your physiological makeup, some athletes are going to require more fuel than others. So in a half marathon, some athletes might use one or two gels. Some athletes might use even three or four, but it's really dependent on their individual needs um, and their internal physiological makeup. So this, this, when you're talking about athletes and performance, as you know, there is 10 million variables that you need to consider. But the most important one is that you're unique and not listening to what anyone else does, you need to find out what works best for you. Yeah, it's part of the fun and part of the frustration. Yeah, well, that's it. It's, you're always learning. And the thing is that um, every single person is unique. Like they have a physiological makeup that's unmatched. Like there's no one else like you on the planet. Yeah, so, and my experience too. Like what works for you now may not work for you in a year's time as well. Yeah, well, that's right. As you get faster. So, you know, as we get fitter, we increase blood volume. Um, the efficiency at which oxygen and glucose and all the nutrients are, are being uh, transported to the muscles becomes more efficient. Our use of oxygen is more efficient. Um, but as we get faster, we're expending more energy as well. So that's those sort of things start to change. Um, so yeah, you're spot on. It, 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 it's, it's constantly evolving. For sure. So when it comes to the products, essentially, you're just looking for one with no, no fructose, essentially. That's going to give you the best opportunity to limit your GI stress. And then you combine that with figuring out like what your stomach tolerance is. Yeah, correct. If, if, if you're finding that you are having stomach issues, first thing to look at if there is fructose in the ingredients, because we've found that that has been um, an indicator. Um, secondly, um, the volume and the amount that you're consuming. So... Firstly, looking at your, at your watch for your, and during your key sessions and seeing what your calorie expenditure is. And um, in key training sessions that you might, you know, take one or two gels at, at higher intensity, sort of close to the competition and see how it sits on your stomach. So make as many mistakes as possible in training and you're less likely to make them during the, the event. Great advice. Now, PK asked a question similar to what we've been talking about. Can you overdo the gels? I think we've summed that up pretty well. The second question, though, is around cramping. And he says, when cramping during a race, would electrolytes be more useful than gels? Or do each have its own place and alleviate the cramp? What we've recognized um, with muscle cramping is that if you have a higher sodium concentration in your sweat, you're going to be more likely to to uh, experience cramping. Um, and that's been simply because the amount you've lost compared to the amount that you've consumed has, um, it, there's, the thing is with cramping, it's, it's difficult to understand because there's so much, um, well, there's not so much um, uh, published articles out there because you, you can't publish an article on hydration because there's so many variables. So we could do a test on all the athletes here right now, but the, the conclusion would be that you, you lose this much sweat, you lose this much sodium, 
but it's based on the intensity that you've run at and it's based on the environmental conditions you've done the run in. So that's great. So we know what you need to do at that intensity in those environmental conditions. But if you change the temperature by 10 degrees one way or the other, you're going to get a different conclusion. You, the results are going to be different. So you're constantly changing. So if we um, took this particular athlete and he did a marathon down in Melbourne and it was you know, nine or 10 degrees, it's very unlikely that he's going to experience muscle cramping because he's not losing the volume of sweat and the accumulative amount of sodium that he would if he was doing a marathon in Singapore. So um, what, what you need to do in that, in that instance is recognize that in hotter, more humid conditions, we're simply generating more heat. We're sweating a lot more to try and keep a safe core temperature. So our blood volume loss is greater. The amount of sodium that we're losing is greater. And that sodium has a distinct um, connection with how the muscles function. It's, it's what's sending the message from the brain all the way down the spinal cord to the muscles for them to function and to relax and contract. So when that sodium concentration drops, those messages slow and the brain's going, well, we're not supplying what we need to the muscles for them to function properly. I'm just going to slow them down. And a lot of that time is muscle cramping. Um, but then on the flip side, there's some athletes who will go their whole career, race in hot, humid conditions and never cramp. So it's, it, once again, it's an individual thing. Um, if you do experience cramping, it's very likely that you have a very high sweat rate and or a high sodium concentration in your sweat. And if cramp comes on, you should load with sodium or is it too late? Yeah. No, well, well, you've, you've already slowed down even before you start to cramp. Um, so the whole idea is to avoid that slowing down in the first place. And that's just a matter of addressing your needs, which you may not have been addressing properly in the first place. Um, so understanding, which, which a lot of athletes can do first, um, quite simply by doing pre and post weighing, which I'm sure you've, you've done before. Understanding how much sweat that you lose at a certain intensity in, in a certain environmental condition. And that way, um, once you start to recognize the importance of that, what that sweat that's ending up on your skin, what that means, because if that, if that water, which is nice and clear and is, it's not, um, not too scary, if that was red and the color of blood and you'd saw it just dropping onto the ground, you would freak out. The actual sweat is, is, is a component of our blood. So we're actually reducing blood volume as we sweat. We're losing um, uh, the, the most important um, fuel system in our body that's going to, you know, that, that's critical to our performance. 